Maria, First Nation from Chile, Mapuche. Yes. Um, when we remember the referendum of 67, and I think 75% uh, of the people? 90%. 90%. <laughs> Sorry. Was, I think, uh, so she's referring to the referendum in, uh, in which 90% of Australians uh, voted for counting Aboriginal people as part of the population. That one? Yes. So then we jump to the big march crossing the bridge, for example, in Sydney, you know, supporting our Indigenous rights. That was massive. So I remember those times, you know, having a really, really strong support for the rights of indigenous people of this land. So could you pinpoint how this is starting to change and what's the narrative, the way used for this changing and to get to the point of not caring? I don't have the answer to that <laughs> because I'm looking at this from one point in time, which is right now. I would love, mm, I would have loved to, if I could go back in time, when some of these narratives started forming and start to analyze sentiment of the public then and see, because there would have been a journey, right? Because uh, these issues have been going on for quite some time. If you actually boil it down to what's actually happening in each of these narratives, take stolen generations for one example. When I did this research, and I must admit, I didn't know very much about Aboriginal history, the real history, right? Um, so when I was reviewing the data, I was reading some of these stories that were reported and it's just very difficult not to feel intense emotion, you know, just as a human being, as a mother, um, as, a, you know. So there, I, I believe in this sense, there has been a f successful engineered and designed system that shows that it's been successful in oppressing the truth, that's one. Yeah, and I think there's two parts to that. And I, I don't know, I don't have, in, I'm not an expert in this field at all. However, I have lived in Australia for the last 40 years. And I, well, I give away my age. Um, and I've noticed that I realise now, why don't I know anything about it? Well, we never were educated. So that's part one. If you don't educate people about the truth, they don't have a basis from which to form their reality and perceptions of the world. And that's been hugely successful, and I'm afraid that that takes a lot of unwinding to do. Because only now, I've got two children, and they're young, they're seven girls, they're only starting to understand, and they have some topics about Aboriginal culture, and they do NADOC week and all that, but I'm not sure they really get to learn in primary school or high school the true history of Australia. So that's one, education dumbing down, don't tell people, ignorant, I'm ignorant. Part, the second part of the equation, I think, is not to oversimplify things, but the second part of the equation is just taking the narrative of stolen generations. If you were to talk about it in the sense of essentially what it is, force, um, you know, without consent, separation of children from their families, that's actually what's happening. But then if you wrap it up in something like stolen generation, it becomes murky. It becomes, it's a convenient way just to talk about something but not really talk about it. So I think using language, we've watered down what's really happened. And the third part, well, the um, institutional genocide that's been inflicted by the colonists. So stolen generation's one example, taking away your culture and your identity. So there are many parts in which I think we can see the result, which is now we don't care. Now I don't have the answers as to where we should go because it's not an easy one, but my sense is that truth telling through stories is one way. I'm a grassroots connector, you know, I've been 50 years in the ground with the people. And, you know, as follow the law, you know, we are inclusive, you know, and we are peacemakers, yep. and we are connected. So in the ground, I see a different story that this narrative, I don't care. I think it, that don't care narrative is from middle class white privilege, because what I see in the ground, people do care. When, you know, like you say, you know, when we start meeting each other and telling the stories, people do care. 
And I'm pretty sure that, you know, the vast majority of Australia want justice for indigenous people. I don't know if I'm being too optimistic. You know, but Ankalar, you know, I merge in different cultural contexts, which is no white dominant Western. You know, and you know, even Australia, you know, now it's over 50% migrant people. Well, yeah. we are all migrant in the first place, but anyway. <laughs> so you get my point? Yeah, so do you have a question in that? Oh, the language, the language. And I seen the connector language, and I saw this language yesterday, and I'm really impressed and deep gratitude to the organizers of the day yesterday. I saw that language, the language of the heart the language of integrity, mm. the language of authenticity, the language of transparency, and the language of unity. So, you know, this is the thing we need to focus, and the way forward is to focus what we can do now. Mm. You know, we, we got all the answers and yeah, all the skills. I, can I, I, while you're speaking, something came to me. Sorry, if, so, if someone else has a question, I'm happy to. Like Michael said right at the beginning, that the establishment of the Tent Embassy was a wake-up call to Australia. Now, in 50 years of working together with the movement, I've seen enormous change. And I've seen enormous change in sentiment. Like the 500, the, the, you know, the people who marched, the people who marched with us in, 80, in 88, the people who walked across the bridge in 2000. As I put out my tentacles and I put out my work out there, I see that people are responding differently. Whereas at first, images, positive images of, Austra of Aboriginal people were like, you know, they were just unknown to mainstream Australia. Now it is, you know, I've had people say to me, oh look, I wanted to know about that person and I feel I've got to know them through those photographs. So I feel a change in sentiment. Now you might say it's a small band of people, but I'm wondering if you've got a way of measuring that because mm. that is actually our muscle mm. and that's what we've got to build on, I think, mm. don't you? Unfortunately, the way that we do our research, we can't go back in time to see how things have evolved and changed. So I, I, no doubt that you on the ground through lived experience um, see sentiment shifts. I say that from my perspective, it's not enough to move the needle. So there's still a lot of way to go. And going back to what the previous lady was saying, what was coming to my mind was, you know, there was the marriage equality campaign that was very successful, okay? Now I am a lesbian, so I've got so many diversity cards overflowing, I'm a bit greedy. I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm Asian, and I'm gay, right? And I've got a fifth one, which is, you know, a medical condition. Um, so, <laughs> not insanity. So, <laughs> so I understand. Like I, when I was thinking about the success, of the gr the eventual success, the eventual success of the um, marriage equality campaign, I was thinking about over time how language was used as well. Because remember, it went through an evolution. At the very start, it was gay marriage. Oh, that didn't sit very well, was it? Then it was same-sex marriage. Oh, that was maybe better, but still same-sex marriage. And then there was the whole, you're coming down on the word marriage and institution of marriage. Then it became um, marriage equality, and I think that's what it landed on. So you can just see with language and how it's used, because we're all emotional beings. And so I think what made that campaign successful, right? Um, I believe, in my view, that there was significant media support and it was the time was coming because you know we knocked on the door a few times with different prime ministers and they all said no and then Turnbull almost cracked it almost cracked it and then he finally did so it just takes time but it was continuous consistent also showcasing more gay people so we're not all aliens and scary. You know, similar things, similar plights to any um, discriminated um, group of people, right? So I see hope in that example because um, at the end of the day, you know, if that could go through and the issues of white, um, of white Australia, you know, they have to be challenged, so they can be challenged, right? So when you think First Nations, Aboriginal history, we just don't even know what the history is yet. I want to know what the true history has been. I want to hear about all the ugliness because there's no way to move on unless you address your own history. And I don't think Australia has an identity anymore. Like, I really don't feel we know who we really are besides meat pies, veg Vegemite, 
and cricket. Like, you know, there's more to us than that. And it's really frustrating. So, um, so yeah, I do see hope. Um, and I do believe just my sense is that it's bubbling up the stories because we're humans. We're all, it's a humanity issue. It's not a black issue or a white issue. It's a human issue. Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Diane Coe. I was a caretaker at the Aboriginal Ten Embassy not long ago. My mother's Isabel Coe. I've been involved with um, the struggle all my life. Every Aboriginal person in this building has been involved in the struggle all their life. You've said a couple of things there. So I was just going to reply to some things that you've said, Sister Girl. First of all, and I'm not being nasty in any way I'm saying this, but your, that was your choice not to learn about us. You could have went out and learned off an Aboriginal person. There's enough Aboriginal people. But what can we do as Aboriginal people? Because I'm going to tell you something. I used to work for the Education Directorate here in ACT. As soon as I told them that a white person is not the appropriate person to be teaching our history, I was sacked. So you've got people like me that speak and speak out about the truth, and then you've got people that are saying, you've got the government saying, that they want to make change, but they don't really want to make change. They want to keep us here stagnant, and I'm a proud woman, and I am no longer going to be stagnant for no government. But I ask yourself this question, why? Why is the ignorance? Because it's taught behaviour. It is taught behaviour by a system. Whatever you sit back, and any person in here that sits back and allows that system that keeps destroying us, Understanding, the churches come here, they destroyed our culture. Science come here, it destroyed our science. What makes you think that you or any of these laws precede our laws or precede us as a people? We, took after, we looked after this country. It was pristine. We, did have not disease, we didn't have diseases that have come here. But okay, you've come. We understand that. We're willing to get along. That's the thing that you haven't. And a lot of other non-Indigenous people haven't sat down and said, I'm willing to get along with you. I'm willing to get along with you, sister, today. Because you know why? I'm willing to get along. But is the rest of the world ready to get along? Um, if I may, one of the things that frustrates a lot of Aboriginal people is that, you know, we really want change. Yeah. And unfortunately, every time we look at people in power and position, um, there's always this, this sort of, um, you have the ability to make changes and work with us. And how do we convince those people? How do we change that so that we get those people with that knowledge, with that power, to move forward with us? Because we need to make that change, and we, we're trying to say we want that change, but, you know, from the information that you've, re you know, rolled off there, sort of, it's, it's very concerning. Um, and that's why I asked you to have a look at that, because, you know, we need to understand what's there. Now, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, there was just a, a sort of a, a, a small sort of, I suppose, um, 0.3 on the Richter scale when they set fire to the, uh, the doors at Parliament House. But other than that, as you, as you rightfully say in those graphs that you put up there, the people really didn't care. Yeah, they really didn't. So, but when that embassy was put up, that sent a ripple right across this country. And it shocked them that Aboriginal people dare to do this. Yeah? And so the message I'm getting is we have to take a very strong stand and we have to confront the system in a similar way to what we did there. Yeah. And until we create a, a, a 6.9 and above on the Richter scale in politics in this country, they will continue to ignore us. So we need to make our, as Gary said earlier, we need to make ourselves, and, and what you said, we need to make ourselves relevant. And right now, we are not relevant. So if you can make that, uh, just respond to that. As I said, I don't have the solution. This is a very, very complex thing. It's, you know, it's 
evolved over time. I would love to have gone back in time and see how I think some of these narratives did evolve because at some point I think it would have been very important. In my view, what I read is what people engage with online. So if there is insufficient material online, if insufficient coverage online, I can't read anything. And then my conclusion is that we don't care. So looking at that as a, you know, again, I go back to the marriage equality topic. That got through, that got through, finally. It's, it's a similar sort of journey, I think, you know, in how you bring the population across, right? Um, I, I wish I had the answer. But what I can tell you now is that uh, the term stolen generation doesn't mean anything anymore. If you wanted to re resurrect that topic, it has to be something new because it's already carrying dead weight. It's a narrative and if it's a brand, you're in danger, right? So to get yourself out of that sort of dead zone, you might as well start a new story because it doesn't carry any of the past sentiment and misconceptions and whatever else you've got to clean out. Same thing with Aboriginal deaths in custody. I think the fact we call it deaths in custody, we're so used to listening to the news now saying case deaths, COVID deaths, we don't really, it doesn't make us feel anything anymore, the word death. But if you say young Aboriginal suicides or hanging, that straight to the point, I think it actually has more success telling it for what it is. That's my view, yeah. Data analysis is only as good as um, where data. your data sources come from. And so can I get you to talk a little bit about where your sources come from? Like, yep. um, are you looking at social media? Are you looking at the internet? Are you picking up media stories? Are you yep. going um, behind the scenes? Um, you know, to uh, where encrypted data is, for example, and the conversations yeah. that people are having there. So in short, when I refer to uh, the data that I use, which is on the internet, it's everything that is outside a firewall. So, for it, so it includes anything online, which is websites, blogs, news articles, social media posts, everything outside a firewall. I mean, so I can't see inside our personal conversations the companies that have the platforms can see that, but for people like me, we, we source open sourced data on the internet. So that's actually quite a lot of information. I mean, it, it also includes false information. What we can't see is what, whether something is false or true. What we can tell you is how people are reacting to the information. So that's a very succinct way of explaining. I hope that explains your question about where we get our data from. Hi, I'm um, Gummy Pingle Waka and Waramai. Um, Gummy Pingle is the, um, where the people of the spear. Waka and I walk my totem, crow, walk in uh, this world, uh, past, present and future. And uh, Waramai is my nation. Uh, now, sister, I, I actually do an um, analysis and I like playing with it. So yeah, with the, um, your uh, yeah, Facebook and that, like I actually, uh, you know, like I, I actually go into white supremacy sites. I'm a Guri woman, proud Guri woman, right? And um, so I actually go on them because I know they're collecting us data, right? Okay, then my question, I've got actually a few, but anyway. Um, but my question for you is, um, I, uh, when you say, where do I fit in your analysis? Because uh, I don't watch TV. I only go on the internet and that to actually manipulate the data that they actually are thinking because I know what they're gathering, right? I've been told, and because I walk in the free worlds, I'm actually connected to my ancestry. They brought me back to that in 2009 and I've been walking my, with my ancestors ever since and um, that's why I don't do the television and I don't do social media. Any of my friends that are drawn into that, I, I move away because I know that it's just manipulation. The whole of this COVID thing is actually, have a look at it. Really look at it. What happened in this in this uh, country? And you've got. To, I'm very spiritual, right? And funny enough, in my body form, I actually have the free people. I am come in as a black woman, as a Caucasian, as which I look, and I actually have Asian sister. You know, I have Japanese and Chinese. I know who I am, right? And this is what. And then going back to Uncle, how he said, "What is the change? 
All us Guri people, we need to connect back to our ancestry. And same as all other ancestry, we need to connect. We need, what was that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have a yeah, question? Yeah, I do have a question. Yeah, so where do I, I did ask the question, where do I fit in in your analysis? Like I do analysis and all that. So where do I fit in? Because I don't do the television and all that. That's a very good yeah, question yeah. and something that's always asked. Yeah. So when we do our analysis of behaviour online, right, we actually don't look at individual people. So I can't tell you, um, you know, who you are. And it's actually irrelevant because the question that I'm answering is, does society in general, as a general consensus, what is the sentiment? I don't need to know individually or how many people subscribe to a particular view. No, I don't. We don't look at individual people. That, that stuff is Cambridge Analytica territory and they don't, don't exist anymore. Yeah, <laughs> for a reason. Yeah. In the distillation to love and fear, was that data-driven or theory-driven? Uh, did you say it's data-driven or...? Theory-driven. Fear-driven. Theory. 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 Oh, OK. The theory is anal the data is analysed using psychologi psychological theory. OK. Thank you. So um, when I talk about, you know, things all graduating up to two here are emotions, there are all the finer emotions which you yeah. can't see in the charts because of the resolution, but, you know, we can get into things like despair and hate mm. and dissidence and hesitance, like all the finer emotions that are, you know, nuanced emotions. So all of that is actually quite helpful to understand because then you can, when you're messaging on a narrative, you need to speak and address those feelings. So imagine, like, I do a lot of work with co uh, companies and they're always trying to influence people to buy their stuff. They're trying to make sure how they can communicate in a way that's relevant to society. So if they're trying to sell something that people are, have fear around, they need to address the fear, which is the point I was making with vaccine hesitancy when it went deep red. At that point in time, in March 2021, the messages should have been addressing the fear. And I can see the different story threads that shape that fear narrative. But the government didn't do that. They were advised to go with the jab trope, the jab trope, get the jab, you know. They're advised to do visuals, campaigns of needles. Like, there's people who don't like the thought of needles. So, you know, this is, again, in my mind, it was such an unsuccessful messaging campaign. It was only when we were forced to lock down that people started getting the jab, to be honest, really. Right. So um, in that way, I mean, there's the, this stuff is I've only just shown you the tip of the iceberg for the purposes of sparking the conversation. But there's a lot under the hood there to really understand how we communicate to people and why. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah, I mean, like, you know, like vaccination is the same as jab. Right. So when Professor Gary was talking about in China, how do they communicate it? Yi miao just means immunisation. It is, it is what it is. Did they use a you know, metaphor? No. So, um, and we use the jab metaphor, and the UK used that a lot too. So it kind of gives you a bit of the umbilical cord link to why we say what we say here in Australia. There's always a link to Britain, and now the US, from what I see. My second question is um, kind of murkier, <laughs> but it... it uh, uh, leads into what you've just been talking about around messaging. Um, so I'm a bit confused around the um, the emotive and simple and murky messaging versus the direct and truthful messaging. And I'm wondering, is it better to... I know, and you said something like... Um, uh, Aboriginal youth hanging, like re-message as Aboriginal youth hangings. And I'm wondering, if I say something like, died by suicide, it's much less emotive than killed themselves. Can you help me and maybe others th nut that out a bit about yeah. what? That's a very good question. So I would actually uh, test that hypothesis, whether death by suicide versus, what was the other one? Killing themselves. Killing themselves, which one had more emotional charge. Like, if you're trying to use a message, I would be testing both of them. Because they would have different, yeah, what if What if we're, like, a smallish 
community-based group that doesn't have access to all of that um, wonderful science? <laughs> I don't have the answer to that one either. Um, I mean, I was interested in doing this for Michael um, because I think it's an important um, reality check as to how, like, I look at the world this way and the way that I look at the world is predictive of future outcomes, as you can see, and it's what I do for a living to predict trends in market for government and, pe and companies, right? So when this question came up, I was really keen to get involved. To do this really properly, there are so many issues to test. And I would be, um, if this was a, a commissioned project, I'd be working with you to test them all, or as much as I can. Because there are stories here that have resonance with, the, with society right now. The ones that I tested don't, right? But I don't think that Australians don't care. My definition is within the context of this small study, Australians don't care within this context of this study, yeah? There is something that's gonna be, Duke and Gorge was timeless, right? I think there's also something interesting around climate change because climate change is, I think, a conversation where um, First Nations can connect. And there's, this is all about art and science. So what I'm showing you here is the art of applying science to communicate messages. Now, climate change has a lot of narratives that are timeless and some are transformational. I can tell you now that um, Malcolm Turnbull connected with climate change is uh, transformational. He has a lot of influence in shaping that narrative. So we've got to find those narratives and where can the First Nations or Aboriginal people connect with the already established important to society narratives. I believe climate change is one of them. I really do. So we will find a way. Yeah. And I'd love to help however way I can. I was just wondering, yeah. um, you're talking about speaking in that, when we start telling our stories to people and because we are filled with so much emotion because that's who we are as a people, um, we are called confronting but we're called confronting. So every time that, you know, all I'm just starting to say is them four men, they tried to tell their, tell their story 50 years ago. Where has it gone? What we're trying to say is, yes, you know, how many, how many generations do we have to teach and, and, and try and educate? We're not trying to hate. We're trying to educate you people for you to understand us and to say, listen, enough is enough. While ever I sit back, I'm a part of that system up there on the hill that keeps damaging. Because it's not this. Understand this, what I say. Whatever door we open for our people, we also open the door for every Australian here. So that Aboriginal 10 Embassy did not just open the door for Aboriginal people. It opened the doors for education. It opened the doors for health. It opened the doors for justice to change. But not, it has never changed to our, to our and how we as a people needed to change because where our laws and our common sense stands is way better than the common sense. Where, I don't see any common sense up on par in Parliament Hill, on Hill up there. I agree with that one, yeah. Obviously there are parts of society that fall outside your data collection points and I'm wondering would it be beneficial to target those people on a grassroots level in terms of changing sentiment or are we just all slaves to Instagram now? Mm. We all choose what we engage with online. And that's the nature of what I research. The power of what I research is in the privacy of your own digital screens, when you are staying up to date with, with what's going on in the world, with news, or if you're researching something, if you want to find out about something, if you're connecting with other people, you're doing that in the privacy of your own digital screen so it becomes more unbiased. But you naturally are drawn to topics that are interesting to you, right? So when we do this research, we're pulling the level of interest and engagement of the people who are naturally selected in that topic. Meaning, like, say, for example, if you're in, in the market to buy a car, right? So not everyone's always about buying a car at that point in time, but if you're in the market to buy a car, you'll be doing lots of behavioural searches and engagement online with information about cars and reading about this and that. Now, we pick up on how important research on cars is and what they're looking at and that sort of stuff. Now, I don't know who this person is and it doesn't matter, but if there's enough people who are researching cars at any point in time, electric vehicle cars or hybrid cars or whatever, we can pick up 
what's most important in relation to cars. So in this example, like what we're seeing here is that there's not enough people generally naturally selecting themselves to engage with First Nations narratives, the selected few that we've looked at. That's how I determine um, the insight. So everything has to be taken into context. And not everyone's on the internet, that's fine, I understand that, but a lot of people in Australia are. Right? And even if you're not on the internet and you get your news just from print newspaper, most often than not, newspaper material reflects digital material. It's not like news from print is a different topic or suite of news stories to digital. They're now the same. So anything in news world, if you're a traditional paper person or a digital person, we will still see it anyway because of that link. Does that make sense? Just on that point, a lot of our information is still stays within, within a circle and it doesn't go outside of that. That's not what we want. And, um, and so we keep that for ourselves, the storytelling. That's our business. That's not anyone else's business. And um, we'll always keep that in-house. Um, so I have another question. Um, it is a question. <laughs> so Questions only. Question. Uh, I am Anthony. Um, I went to three different schools in three different countries when I was young. Um, I've noticed in your presentation and several other questions the topic of narrative and education. And uh, the question I have is, is there um, today with the new technology through social media uh, a way to influence the narrative to children the next generation that is coming, and if done properly, how long does it take to change a mindset? I look at the climate change narrative, and that's really been driven and spearheaded by the younger generation because they understand it, they, you know, they're, they're passionate about it, um, they're not as, I suppose, they're not like us, we've tried so many things, we've given up, you know, they have a lot of that energy and I think it starts with them understanding the implications of a topic like climate change to their lives. Now, I don't think we have that at the moment with understanding our true history. Um, and I know that my children, they're only young, they have a lot more awareness of Aboriginal culture at their age, which is seven, than I did in my life. So I think it's starting to. But I think the question here is, Michael, like where do you want to really go? Like, what, what is the objective of this conversation? Decolonisation seems like a legal conversation more than a public sentiment driven one, I don't know. I mean, that's the pathway that you're going through as well, right? Because if the question was, how do you get the public behind you and maybe get a referendum, the answer is it's gonna be very, very difficult. That's my, like, so if the, if the objective is to try to get support, the Australian pub public behind you, that's one path for one outcome, but if you're pursuing decolonisation through a legal path, most of the Australian public, public don't understand the law anyway. Like, that's a completely different conversation. Yeah. The, um, the idea here is to get this data, and the data that you've shown me gives me a lot of information right now, um, even though it's just the tip of the iceberg. But I can say that um, from experience, um, that when we put the beach umbrella up, um, the government, McMahon government, didn't engage with us. Um, they set about going out there to the Aboriginal communities. And may he rest in peace, but Senator Bonner led an Aboriginal man, led a lot of non-Aboriginal people, politicians, senators, out into Aboriginal communities to, and he, he divided a lot of people in the north, in, in, in the Gulf, in the northern part of Cape York, and he did that when Joe Bielke Peterson wanted to change the narrative in terms of self-governance within those uh, Aboriginal communities because just at that time uh, they were taking away the mission managers. And this is 1977. And so from 77 onwards um, they, were, they were moving uh, Aboriginal people. They took the managers away from there. And so these, these commandants now, and then all of a sudden we had a situation like we experienced in New South Wales. One of the problems was back home in Walgut, we had a mission there, Gingi, and in, on that reserve, one of the things that I look back on, um, my, you know, I took particular notice, 
was the fact that um, when they took the mission manager away in 69, the last man was a man called Reg Sortell. And that man, when he left, he became the welfare officer in the town. But the welfare officer was to focus on Aboriginal welfare. So they were still hanging on. The issue that arose in that town was that the Aboriginal people were not educated sufficiently enough to understand how white people do things and how white people think. And the other thing was the white township in Walgett were not ready to accept all these black fellas free roaming around the streets. And it caused a major problem. And it happened all over New South Wales. And it happened also in Queensland. And Aboriginal people, because none of our old people, none of our people knew how to relate to those white people. You know, we, we'd walk along and everybody walked along the streets thinking, wonder what that white fella thinking about me. Wonder if I'm allowed to go in that shop. So there's this hesitancy, you know, like this vaccine hesitancy now. But the hesitancy was, will we or won't we? And will these people, so how do I respond to rejection? That's what Aboriginal people were trying to work out. And, um, and so there's, you know, there's, there was this enormous hesitancy and frustration, and the white people were not prepared either. So the Australian government just basically opened the gates, as they say, and said Aboriginal people are free to go wherever they want and do whatever they want. But the white people were never prepared for that. And so that's when the racism emerged in the townships and shops started closing down. Then they didn't want blunt, drunken blacks on the streets and they shut the pubs down and started serving alcohol out the side window, etc. Because Aborigines were now allowed uh, to have this. And so it's a little bit looking at this data here now. You know, I'm looking at that and we want to affect change. So all of a sudden I'm looking at it and Australia don't care. Yeah, so even though this might be a very small sampling, but it's given us something to look at. And it's given us something, it's shown to me that if I'm going to start now doing something for our people to make a significant change and go down that road of decolonization, we have to do something that will shock the shit out of them. Yeah? We have to get in their, in their faces and we have to do something that they least expect. Yeah? And so what is that? What will that look like? because we have to remove or, or, or shift them out of their complacency. And the moment we shake the tree, we'll get action. But we have to be very smart about it, because if you shake the tree too hard, they'll send someone and shoot you. Yeah? And they'll find a way of putting you in jail. Right, so, so the system basically is, the ball's in our court, as I said this morning. The ball's in our court. How do we make this move? What do we do to shift it? And that's why I asked you to deliver some information here to us today so the people here can get a bit of an idea of where the Australian mood is right now. And so some of the stuff that you've shown there, like I say, it's just the tip of the iceberg. But it's, tell, it's telling me, though, that we need to shake that tree and we need to shake it hard. Yeah? And then we open those doors and we open the minds of the general public of Australia and say, oh shit, we've got to do something about this, yeah? They're not, going to, they're not going to take any notice if we're going to be passive and run around saying, oh, please, Massa, what can I do? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking you to help me. What, the thing that annoys me most is when we have meetings and then the people say, and we look at each other and we say, where's the money? Or they say, oh, we put a submission into NIA, down to Prime Minister and Cabinet, or we put a submission into APSIC, or we put a submission into the government for money. Well, hang on a minute, that's not what we're after. You know, because as soon as you apply to them, they own you. And so this information is telling me um, that the politicians are not gonna do anything for us unless we create an earthquake and shift that brown, shift that. Yep. I think the, uh, the way politicians listen is when it's election time, they sort of try to pretend to listen. And I think if you were to shake any trees, it's time to shake the time them now. Is now. The yep. time is now. Yep. 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 Um, I, I just have a question. 
Go back to 1967 when that vote was on, you know, for non-Aboriginal people to allow us to become citizens and that. Um, what data was used to shape that narrative, if there was any? Back in 1967, yeah. when I was not alive, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might have found some old data. I don't know that one. Um, yeah. I wish I could go back in time to look at it, but no, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Because that was the great Australian silence around that period. And, you know, there was no dialogue for our people or from the government to our people. Can I, just on what Maureen said there at that time as well, so let's go back at 20 years before that. Yeah, there was an Aboriginal lady who went to London um, and the London Missionary Society were going to give her speaking rights at the UN. I think it's 1948, give or take a few years. Anyway, but this Aboriginal woman turned up in London and uh, the United Na uh, the, um, the London Missionary Society was going to give her the, their speaking rights at the United Nations. Um, we found all the documentation when we were in London how the United Nations actually sent uh, the secretary to the, um, to the UN, wrote to Australia, the Prime Minister, saying, I'm alerting you to the fact that there's an Aboriginal person about to be given rights to come here and raise questions about what's going on in Australia. And this woman is going to come, and we understand she's going to be in about three months, we need your advice, the government, on how we, the UN, is going to deal with this issue, right? Now, that is a complete betrayal of the operations of the United Nations, completely. But nonetheless, what it showed to us, and it shows to us now, that there are people in high places who know that here in Australia, there's an earthquake yet to be had, yeah? and the Australians are not going to like it. And Mabo, I guess, if you were to go back and look at Mabo and do the, do the sums and do the survey then, like one thing we do know, yeah, that the white Australians panicked because they were worried about their backyards. They were worried that we were coming into Sydney and we're going to tell them all to get out of all clues and double bay, yeah? We're coming to collect. Now, that sent a panic right through the, right through the nation. Mm. And so that's the type of impact that we need now to find and make that happen again um, so that we can turn that Richter scale and get some better information coming out. Once again, from your data, is the strongest um, impetus love or fear? Strongest impetus love or fear? That I don't know. Okay. I can't tell. Well, well, if I did... If I did look at it with that question in mind, I could be able to tell you. However, if you just think, just in terms of, and I'm not a psychologist or an expert in the field at all, but what do you remember more? Things that you love or things that you hate that strike fear? Like, what do you, you remember pain more than gain? And that's typically a marketing tool to sell people fear more than gain. Uh, so I think I would err on the side of fear, but I, I would go back and verify it with a proper way. I hope that answers your question. Mine was just a question about the five examples that fell in the, like, not up in the timeless category. They were all, like, compassionate issues. So they didn't necessarily have a direct call to action on the people, which is separate from a 67 referendum where people have a voice and a vote, um, whereas this is uh, an information realm where everyone's got compassion fatigue. And so I guess, yeah, my question is... Um, yeah, maybe, was there any data that looked at an issue that was more in the celebration mm. of culture rather than uh, something calling you to be compassionate without knowing exactly how you could contribute or be um, acting from your moral conscience yep. in a united way? Yes. Um, um, there is stuff that's positive, for sure. Why do people buy things? Because they like to f chase joy. Um, in everyday industry, it's like with retail, and I know that I've got one client that we've done skincare, and you can either sell on gain or pain. So we tested the idea of, you know, do you sell on the message of, oh, do you want wrink uh, how do you deal with wrinkly skin, how do you deal with blotches, or 
test narratives such as, do you want glowing skin? Do you want healthy looking, youthful skin? All that stuff. Now the answer was super clear. I can't tell you the answer because it's client paid work. But so there definitely is joy uh, narratives as well, love narratives. Um, the one example that I showed you, if you can remember when I was explaining the emotion wheel, it had intense green and intense red and intense blue. So those combinations, that narrative was actually a reality TV show. Now in reality TV, what's the main aim for a producer to move people, to move people emotionally, to keep watching? And when you have a show that's a reality TV, that particular profile for that show was a successful narrative showing that you created love, you created hate and fear, you had a villain and a hero, and you had expectation, what's going to happen next? That TV show was married at first sight. I don't know if you watch it, but I watched it, and I watched it all the way through because they created those feelings, those emotions. So yes, you can have strong emotions of love that drive you to do something as well. It's not like taking a rat test. Rat test, do I have, it not, have COVID, yes or no? This is actually, because narratives are interrelated and complex and they change over time, you look at things like these topics over time and you look at how they interrelate with each other to give a very good view of the world. It's not just one, um, one point in time, one narrative. It's not that simple. So that's why I don't have an answer. You know, this is sort of like scratching the surface, but the answer of where we are now really quickly shows you that there isn't, you know, there isn't enough movement. People don't care. And that's the reality. I wish it was different. In terms of um, getting those narratives up into the green zone, uh, would you maybe recommend for um, uh, young Aboriginal people to study digital marketing <laughs> and copywriting? Because um, I know, you know, my friends in Canberra here, there's departments full of like 20 people on the digital media team coming up with um, how to get the story sounding better. You know, even when everything's going. Um, so the going question wrong, is, how can you, know? you hack it so that you make people care and well, get? Well, you know, to get the young people, what do they do into the future? Could mm. you maybe recommend um, digital marketing? You know, uh, something like that. We're talking about digital narratives, right? Yeah, digital marketing, I don't... My, my sense is it's not that easy to study digital marketing to engineer an outcome um, like that. If it was, everyone would be studying it and everybody would be paying big dollars to move the needle of the population. I don't think it's as simple as that because, um, yeah, digital marketing in itself is just executing messages through different platforms using digital platforms. It's not about the... Exec it's about... It's about, I think, always keeping a pulse on the mood of the population, understanding where they're at, crafting messages that cut through, having a platform sufficient to reach enough people, being consistent over time. That's, I think, the formula. After looking, after, looking at narratives and thousands of them across different industries over time, I feel that those are the ingredients to get something across the line for a major campaign. That all requires strategy, and it requires resources and coordination. None of it's insurmountable. It's just a lot of work to do. Not insurmountable, though. Yeah. Thank you. All right, people, let's have a cup of tea and come back in about 15 minutes. Yes, please, thank you.